Hello, welcome. My name is Divine. I am a fourth year medical student. Uh, this will be the 20th episode of the Divine Intervention Podcast, and today we're going to continue our story relating to the antibiotics. I'm going to primarily discuss the protein synthesis inhibitors. So let's begin. Now, remember the central dogma, right, of uh, molecular biology, where you basically start with DNA, okay, and then that DNA via the, via the process of transcription is made into RNA, and then the RNA via the process of translation is made into protein. And there are certain raw materials you do, in fact, need for translation, right? So you need like tRNA uh, that has uh, on the three prime end, it has the amino acid, and then it also has the anticodon, right? That pairs up with mRNA. The second raw material you need for the synthesis of proteins, right? You need the ribosome. In bacteria, which is what we're trying to target today, right? We have a large subunit, that's the 50th subunit, and a small subunit, that's the 30th subunit. And that together forms the... 70s subunits contrast with humans that have a 60 and a 40s that makes up the 80s ribosome and then we need an actual mrna right which was made by the process of transcription so mrna uh, from the 5 prime to 3 prime end right it's loaded onto like the e p and a side of the ribosome right and the thing is the first trna you should hopefully know that it goes to the p site okay and um the first Amino acid that's classically made in bacteria is a methionine, a formulated methionine, okay? In fact, FMET is a, something known as a PAMP in the world of immunology. It's a pathogen-associated molecular pattern. Uh, it's something that's not found in humans, right? So it's something that I need immune system recognizes uh, to go after these uh, nasty bugs. So... Uh, the P site, right? So uh, let me just hone in on some of these uh, high yield sites and just give a very quick overview of the pharmacology before going to the specific drug details. But the P site has uh, 50 and 30 subunits that contribute to it. Okay. And the thing is, if you work at the P site as an antibiotic, you're inhibiting initiation. So the 50S contribution to the P site is inhibited by linazolid. Okay. We'll talk about it. It's a drug used to treat MRSA and VRE, it's an oral medication. Alternatively, the 30th contribution to the P sites can be inhibited with the aminoglycosides, right? So like your gentamicin, neomycin, amikacin, tobramycin, and streptomycin. Now, in regards to the A site, right, there are drugs that inhibit that A site. And if you're an A site inhibitor, it should make sense that you inhibit the elongation step of protein synthesis, okay? And for the 30th contribution to the A site, that inhibition is done by your tetracyclines. Remember, on your, unlike your aminoglycosides that are bactericidal, your tetracyclines are bacteriostatic, okay? Now, for the 50th contribution to the A site, the drugs that inhibit the, uh, that site are your streptogramins, like dalfopristin, quinopristin, uh, they cover MRSA. We'll talk about those later. And then for clindamycin and erythromycin, I'll sort of discuss those together. Uh, clindamycin is in a different drug class from erythromycin. Erythromycin is a macrolid, okay? But your macrolids and clindamycin in general, they bind to the 50th subunit and basically prevent movement along the messenger RNA, right? So you're basically inhibiting translocation, okay? Uh, translocation is one of the sub-steps in the elongation step of, of protein synthesis in translation. Now, peptidotransferase, right, it's this high-yield enzyme that forms bonds between amino acids during the process of translation. That enzyme is inhibited by chloramphenicol, okay? So chloramphenicol inhibits peptidotransferase. It's a 50S inhibitor. The only 30S inhibitors that are protein synthesis inhibitors are your aminoglycosides, which are bactericidal, and your tetracyclines, which are bacteriostatic. And the mnemonic, right, you'll probably hear this as you're studying uh, for your USMLE exams, but buy at 30 and sell at 50. Okay, so the at 30, aminoglycosides and tetracyclines are 30 S inhibitors. And then the cell at 50, right? So like CCELL, -L, right? So like clindamycin, chloramphenicol, erythromycin, and other macrolids, uh, linazolid, and I believe the lincosamides. Okay, so your aminoglycosides, right? So let's get a little more granular with these drugs. And the thing is, again, I'm not gonna just give you drug names to memorize. Uh, the step one loves to integrate material with multiple fields. So I'll talk about like the different ways these drugs are tested on exams and then provide you the drug names. So the aminoglycosides, right? So they include drugs like gentamicin, okay, neomycin, amikacin, tobramycin, and streptomycin. They all end in mycin, okay? And they are bactericidal, right? And one of the mechanisms they have is that they cause misreading of mRNA. If mRNA is not read properly, you make 
bad proteins and it so happens that those bad proteins they poke holes in the cell membrane and by poking holes in the cell membrane right if you go but if you think back to cell injury that you've probably learned as you're studying pathoma or whatever pathology resource you use you'll see that when the cell membranes become permeable that can cause death right because every that can cause cellular death because all the cell soup is spilling out into the surroundings so uh these drugs are bactericidal okay and i've talked about how they work they're 30s inhibitors now the drug names again gentamicin is here neomycin is another big one okay it's classically tested in the context of like prep before bowel surgery because it's very good at killing off gram negatives as you'll find out uh aminoglycosides cover primarily gram negatives they do not very high yield to know that they do not cover gram positives they cover only gram negatives okay um, and the thing is neomycin can actually be used in the setting of hepatic encephalopathy because it's pretty good at killing off uh, gram negatives and one of the big constituent bugs in your gi tract are gram negative rods so those are covered very nicely with neomycin another drug you can use for that hepatic encephalopathy purpose is uh, rifaximin it's an rna polymerase inhibitor again that is pretty good at killing off your gi flora so you may say divine come on how do these drugs help in hepatic encephalopathy the thing is the bugs in your gi tract make a ton of ammonia okay and the thing is the gi tract with the exclusion of the stomach is primarily basic so ammonia is pretty soluble so it's actually reabsorbed in the gi tract so one thing you could do is you could say okay let me try to take care of the source of the ammonia just kill off all the bugs with rifaximin rna polymerase inhibitor or neomycin aminoglycoside okay so that's how those work in the setting of hepatic encephalopathy remember you could also give lactulose for that purpose right to make lactic acid acidify ammonia you poop it out as ammonium ions okay now amikacin is another aminoglycoside tobramycin uh the big context they test this with is uh Patients that have cystic fibrosis, remember, patients with CF, classically, when they're less than 21, the most common cause of respiratory infections there is staph aureus. But as they become greater than 21, you're going into the territory of pseudomonas, okay? Pseudomonas, you can prophylax against that in a CF patient by giving the inhaled form of tobramycin, okay? Again, because pseudomonas is a gram-negative rod, so it's covered very well by your aminoglycosides. Uh, streptomycin is another low-yield aminoglycoside. It's used to treat, like, drug-resistant TB. Now, again, I said these drugs, they cover gram negatives primarily, including pseudomonas. Uh, the thing is, these drugs do not cover anaerobes because they actually need oxygen to get into a cell. So, the aminoglycosides have no coverage against anaerobes. And one classic thing they test, and this is probably more step two territory, are GI cocktails for the treatment of uh, basically like antibiotic cocktails for the treatment of GI infections. Uh, one cocktail that includes the aminoglycosides is the MAG cocktail. I'm just making that word up, MAG, M-A-G, just to help you remember, metronidazole, ampicillin, and gentamicin okay and you do this because the gentamicin and ampicillin cover gram negatives pretty well metronidazole helps you cover the anaerobes okay another classic gi cocktail is like cipro so ciprofloxacin your fluoroquinolones and metronidazole again cipro it's a fluoroquinolone very good gram negative coverage okay metronidazole helps you cover the anaerobes right so if you get a question about a patient that has like diverticulitis or cholecystitis and they're asking for a recommendation on an antibiotic regimen you want to pick either the mag regimen of metro ampicillin and gentamicin or the cipro plus metronidazole regimen and another high yield thing with the aminoglycosides is they have some nicotinic receptor blocking activity okay uh, remember these nicotinic receptors you find them at three high yield spots in the body right so you find them at the neuromuscular junction okay you'll find those on the cell membranes of the postganglionic neurons of the sympathetic nervous system and also the parasympathetic nervous system right but in addition you also find these receptors on the surfaces of chromaffin cells I remember chromaffin cells are kind of they're part of the adrenal medulla uh, they are kind of modified postganglionic sympathetic neuron okay but they release epinephrine primarily because they express pnmt so aminoglycosides they can actually worsen neuromuscular blockade right so if a person is getting a neuromuscular blocking agent you probably want to be careful with administering aminoglycosides in that population now, what are the side effects of aminoglycosides, right? So they are nephrotoxic. In fact, it's probably one of the most common causes of uh, intrarenal azotemia, right? So like an intrarenal acute renal failure picture. Uh, your aminoglycosides are very nasty to cranial nerve 8, okay? So actually, you can apply this in the setting of Meniere's disease, right? So remember Meniere's disease with a triad of uh, vertigo, tinnitus, and hearing loss. Um, the pathophysiology there is like... Uh, 
endolymphatic hydrops, right? So you have like hydropic swelling of the of uh, like from too much endolymph in uh, in your uh, ear apparatus, right? So those people complain of ear fullness, and then they have like vertigo, tinnitus, and hearing loss. You can actually treat that. Usually, you try like a salt restricted diet. You try like a diuretic, but if that doesn't work, symptoms are refractory. You can inject gentamicin into the into the ear. Okay, so you can give. Uh, uh, you can give gentamicin for that, an intra like uh, auricular injection, and that can basically terminate the Meniere's uh, disease. Okay, and you also want to know your mechanisms of resistance to your aminoglycosides. Uh, don't forget, right? So if uh, Bog encodes a transferase enzyme like an acetotransferase, uh, by adding that chemical group the, to the aminoglycoside, the drug becomes inactivated. Okay, and also many bugs express porins. These porins like actively cause the aminoglycosides to be extruded from the cells. Or uh, certain bugs also have mechanisms to prevent the aminoglycosides from getting in. Okay, so those are your big mechanisms of resistance with the aminoglycosides. So now let's go to the next group. Okay, so from we've talked about the first 30 years aminoglycosides. Let's talk about the tetracyclines, right? So the tetracyclines, they are 30 years inhibitors. They are bacteriostatic. Okay, remember they act at the E site. Okay, the 30 years contribution to the E site, right? So they inhibit elongation. And the big drug names you want to remember here, right? So they all end in cycling, like the meclocycline minocycline, doxycycline, tigacycline. Tigacycline, I'll just say one word about this. It's a, it's a tetracycline that has the ability to cover MRSA. So it's one of those things you want to file away in your brain somewhere. It's one of the more new generation uh, tetracyclines. It belongs to the drug class known as the glycycyclines. Now, what do these tetracyclines cover? Right? So they cover chlamydia pretty well, okay? So you can use that for the treatment of UTIs. Uh, they cover Borrelia burgdorferi, right? Remember, that's uh, the causative agent of Lyme disease. Okay, remember, it's carried by the Ixodes tick. Uh, don't forget for your exams that the Ixodes tick, in addition to carrying uh, Borrelia burgdorferi, that causes Lyme disease, it also carries Bab Babesia microti, okay? Remember that Maltese cross pattern in red blood cells? It can present as a hemolytic anemia. And remember, the Ixodes tick also carries is anaplasma okay so anaplasmosis babesiosis and lyme disease can be caused by a bite from the exodus tick um, your tetracyclines also cover rickettsia rickettsii remember it's one of the causes of rocky mountain spotted fever okay remember the rash on the palms and salts okay remember the other causes of a rash on the palms and salts right so like secondary syphilis kawasaki's disease coxsackie e virus with hand foot mouth disease okay and again rickettsia rickettsii and actually, in Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever, this is actually one of the exceptions where you can give a tetracycline to a kid that's less than 8 years old. In general, the overwhelming majority of the time, if a kid is less than 8 years old, they should not be getting a tetracycline. But if the car, if the disease they have is Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever, you usually take exception to that because... RMSF is pretty fatal, right? So you want to treat it really well, and tetracyclines cover that bug extremely well, okay? Now, um, alternatively, though, you could give chloramphenicol for Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever. Uh, remember, chloramphenicol is a peptidotransferase inhibitor. Um, in fact, I'll say in general, in pregnant women that have Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever, usually the go-to drug is uh, chloramphenicol, okay? Usually chloramphenicol. Now, your tetracyclines, they also cover vibrio species, right? So you can use them for like vibrio cholerae. You can use them for vibrio parahemolyticus and vulnificus. Remember, those cause a watery diarrhea. Uh, vulnificus is particularly bad in people that have like liver disease, okay? Your tetracyclines also cover propioni bacterium acnes, right? So the causative uh, organism in the uh, acne. Um, they also cover H. pylori. In fact, if you H. pylori has two kinds of therapies, right? There is triple therapy that's usually first line and then there's quadruple therapy so triple therapy you can remember it with a cap mnemonic right so cap so c for clarithromycin that's a macrolid a is for amoxicillin we talked about that in the previous podcast and then the p is for a ppi like omeprazole okay but if that doesn't work, you can consider using quadruple therapy. And that's where your tetracyclines come into play, right? So it's a MBTP, right? So M for metronidazole, B for bismuth, subsalicylate, the T is for the tetracycline, and then the P is for the PPI, okay? So that's quadruple therapy. Now, so your tetracyclines do in fact cover H. pylori, okay? And again, like I've said, they're contraindicated in cases that are less than eight years old. And one thing about the tetracyclines is that they are very, they are bound very strongly by divalent ions, so you generally don't want to take a tetracycline with milk, right? Because milk contains calcium and magnesium ions. Those can bind up the tetracycline and it's not reabsorbed in the GI tract. But an interesting uh, parallel to this is 
uh, bones and teeth contain a lot of divalent ions, right? So they are very good at chelating tetracyclines. So if you bind up these tetracyclines, you can sort of imagine, you can sort of like stretch your thinking to imagine that this is potentially how tetracyclines cause a tooth discoloration, okay? And they also inhibit bone growth. Again, that's why you don't give them to moms that are pregnant or kids that are less than eight years old. So, uh, tetracyclines, right? Uh, another big one is the meclocycline. Uh, it actually inhibits the activity of ADH at the principal cell of the collecting duct. Okay, so the meclocycline can actually cause nephrogenic diabetes insipidus as a side effect. You can actually take advantage of that in the treatment of SIDH, right? So in SIDH, you're reabsorbing too much water because you have too much ADH on board. So you can use the nephrogenic diabetes insipidus side effect off the meclocycline to treat SIDH. Remember, for SIDH, you can also use an ADH receptor antagonist, your Vaptans, like Conivaptan or Tovaptan. Okay, now, Lenazolid is the next, next drug I'll talk about. It's a 50S inhibitor. It belongs to a drug class known as the oxazolidinones. Okay, uh, you don't need to know that for step one. Uh, but it's a 50S inhibitor. It's bacteriostatic. Okay, it's a P-site inhibitor, right? So it inhibits the 50S contribution to the P-site. So, uh, what does this drug cover, right? The big things you want to know for your exam is it covers MRSA and VRE. That's essentially all you need to know about lenisolid. And it actually is a relatively clean drug. It's actually pretty expensive, though. If you've ever heard of Zyvox, that's lenisolid. It's a relatively clean drug, and many clinicians like it because it's an oral medication that can treat MRSA, okay? Instead of giving, like, vancomycin. Vancomycin is only available in general as an IV formulation, although you could use oral vancomycin in the treatment of uh, C. diff. Okay, so... Uh, relatively few side effects, but there's one that has started making its way to USMLE exams, and that's the fact that lenazolid can trigger serotonin syndrome when you give it with another serotonergic agent like St. John's wort or sumatriptan or your other triptans that are used for migraines or an SSRI or an SNRI or an MAOI or a tricyclic antidepressant. Okay, so the pathophysiology behind that is that uh, lenazolid actually has some weak monoamine oxidase inhibiting activity. So because it can inhibit monoamine oxidase, it can boost your levels of serotonin. And again, it can trigger serotonin syndrome. Now, uh, the next drug I'll talk about here is clindamycin. Okay, it's a 50S inhibitor. Remember, I said it inhibits translocation, just like your macrolids. Okay, and it's bacteriostatic. And the coverage of clindamycin is actually high yield to know. You want to know that it covers MRSA really well. Okay, in fact, clinda is used very uh, commonly for... Um, for MRSA skin infections like cellulitis, for example. It's also pretty good at covering anaerobes. Classically, it covers anaerobes above the diaphragm, but that's a farce. It also covers anaerobes below the diaphragm. That doesn't really make much sense. But just classic, the classic, classic teaching is anaerobes above the diaphragm, right? So that's why it's used for aspiration pneumonias, right? So if you describe a person that has pneumonia with foul smelling sputum, you probably want to think about an anaerobic cause of that pneumonia, okay? You want to go ahead and cover that with clindamycin. Uh, and remember the high yield anaerobes that pop up every so often on USMLE exams, right? Uh, there's bacteroides, okay, B. fragilis, uh, there's fusobacterium species, okay, and then there's peptospe peptostreptococcus, okay? I dare you to say that 10 times without flinching. Okay, peptostreptococcus. Now, uh, clindamycin on exams has classically been associated with uh, causing C. diff, okay, because it kills off your GI flora, including the anaerobes, so C. diff can overgrow, okay? So you can get into trouble with that. And how do you treat C. diff colitis, right? You generally treat it with metronidazole. We'll talk about that in a different podcast. Um, you can also treat it with oral vancomycin because the vancomycin is not reabsorbed. So you give it orally, stays in the GI tract, kills off the C. diff. If nothing works, you could also consider giving fidaxomycin. Uh, fidaxomycin is one drug that uh, uh, inhibits RNA polymerase. It's used in the treatment of C. diff, but it's one of like your last line meds. But if all that stuff doesn't work, you can then consider trying a fecal transplant. Okay. Now, real quick, I'll just go ahead and reel off the, because I've been mentioning so many RNA polymerase inhibitors. So I think it probably makes sense to just reel them off right now. So you can sort of remember all of them as a group. Fidaxomycin is one. Okay. It's used to treat C. diff colitis. Uh, ribavirin, right, uh, is another. Okay. Remember, ribavirin is used to treat hep C. You can also use it to treat RSV, although that's kind of controversial. Although, don't forget that ribavirin also has another mechanism of action as an inhibitor of inosine monophosphate dehydrogenase. Okay which is the enzyme that's also inhibited by mycophenolate morphetil. 
Then rifampin, that's used to treat TB, right? Remember the ripe regimen is also an RNA polymerase inhibitor. And then if you're going more into the world of toxicology, if you're consuming mushrooms, like deadly mushrooms for some reason, alpha-manitin uh, is an RNA polymerase inhibitor as well. Now, the next drugs I'll talk about are your streptogramins, right? Like quinopristin, dalfopristin, they bind to the A sites. They basically inhibit the 50S contribution to the A site. Remember, I said the 30S contribution to the A site is inhibited by your tetracyclines. The, the 50S contribution is inhibited by your streptogramins, okay? And these drugs are actually bactericidal, okay? They inhibit elongation, right? Because again, if you bind to the A site, you're inhibiting elongation. I talked about the mechanism behind that earlier. And the drug names here again, quinopristin, dalfopristin, and the big coverage you want to know in fact probably the only coverage you need to know for any exam is MRSA these drugs cover MRSA now chloramphenicol it's a 50s inhibitor right I already said it inhibits peptidyl transferase remember this is the enzyme that basically forms peptide bonds between the amino acid chains that you find in the P site and the amino acid that's just coming in the A site okay uh, and this drug it so happens that it's cleared by phase 2 metabolism in the liver right so what's the poster child enzyme for phase 2 metabolism in the liver that's udpgt right so udp glucuronosyl transferase okay udpgt so uh when a kid is born i mean this enzyme is found pretty aggressively in adults but when a kid is born they have very little of this okay in fact this enzyme generally is not induced until a kid is born right so it's something you generally don't have in utero so when a kid is born they have very low levels of this that's why again you generally want to like not give chloramphenicol to uh newborn okay because of this udpgt problem so, what are the bad side effects with chloramphenicol, right? So, one bad side effect is aplastic anemia, okay? It can cause severe bone marrow suppression, right? So, a classic exam scenario here will be like a kid that has been on uh, chloramphenicol or some drug. They may not say chloramphenicol, but they may say kid has been on some drug for nicer menin uh, for, um, uh, nicer meningitis, meningitis, okay, in a developing country because chloramphenicol is actually pretty commonly used in uh, developing countries. And then they say the person starts having like worsening fevers, the person's O2 starts to drop in, and then they say you do like a bone marrow biopsy or whatever, and you get a dry tap like i guess more bone marrow aspiration you get a dry tap or they could show you like a bone marrow histologic image and you see lots and lots and lots of fat cells if you see that uh think about the plastic anemia from chloramphenicol okay it crosses the blood brain barrier very well so it's very good for the treatment of meningitis okay because it also covers gram negatives supremely well uh, another high yield side effect of chloramphenicol is gray baby syndrome okay um it's uh it's a lipid soluble uh, agent right so it can deposit in the brain deposit in other tissues okay uh and again it happens because neonates have a udpgt deficiency okay so it's a uh, physiologic right it's something that they build up with time but initially they have this deficiency so they can clear the drug really well okay so they can get toxicity from the drug uh, and unusual way they can actually test this udpgt business uh, with the uh, context of an adult or like an older kid is in the context of a person that has like uh, an actual UDPGT deficiency, right? So like regular and heart syndrome, like type 1 or type 2, uh, or like Gilbert's, right? So if a patient has like Gilbert's, in general it's asymptomatic, but let's assume they're like severely ill, septic in the ICU, you probably don't want to give them chloramphenicol as a drug because when those people get sick that udpgt deficiency begins to become a little more symptomatic okay so you don't want to like compound their problems by giving them something bad like a chloramphenicol that depends on udpgt for metabolism and again chloramphenicol covers many bugs really well covers gram positives covers gram negatives in fact there's very little resistance to chloramphenicol but the side effects just make it a very uncommon drug in clinical practice covers Neisseria meningitis, again, because I said, again, it crosses the blood-brain barrier. And again, it's the drug of choice, very high yield to know this, it's the drug of choice for the treatment of Rocky Mountain spotted fever in pregnant women, okay? Now, so you bar the gray baby syndrome or whatever teratogenic effects come with chloramphenicol, pregnant women with Rocky Mountain spotted fever get chloramphenicol. That's basically the only time chloramphenicol is ever used for any purpose in, the, in clinical practice, at least in the U.S., now, your macrolides, uh, they are 50S inhibitors, right? So, uh, the 50S subunit of the ribosome has a 23S 
So think of it as a sub subunit. The 23S subunit of the 50S subunit of the ribosome is what is specifically inhibited by macrolides. Okay, and by binding to that subunit, the macrolides prevent translocation. Okay, and I'll just go ahead and mention this now because I feel like this is the best place to slot this in. But that's actually the mechanism of resistance to macrolides. If you methylate that 23S part of the 50s subunit of the ribosome you basically prevent the macrolides from binding okay and they lose their effectiveness now the big things you want to big drug names you want to remember for your macrolides are like azithromycin they all end in romycin right so azithromycin clarithromycin erythromycin oligomycin right and you may say oh macrolides there's not much we use them for there's actually a lot of things that are potentially exam testable but macrolides so i'm going to talk about them uh, right now uh, first thing is these macrolides are cleared by the liver. Okay, they're cleared by the liver. Big deal. So if a person has liver dysfunction, maybe reduce the dose of macrolides that you give them. That's not a very testable factoid. But a testable one is their effect as motilin receptor agonists. Okay, so motilin is a thing you find in the GI tract that activates re motilin receptors and it causes a uh, it's prokinetic it increases GI motility so if a patient has diabetic gastroparesis you can actually treat that with metoclopramide that's a dopamine receptor antagonist but you could also use erythromycin uh, motilin receptor agonist to treat diabetic gastroparesis uh, in fact, this explains why GI upset is probably like one of the most common side effects with uh, macrolids. Okay, uh, erythromycin, the uh, high yield thing with erythromycin. In fact, in general, erythromycin you try to avoid it in like newborns because the thing is it can cause an intrahepatic cholestasis. Okay, uh, because it can actually precipitate in bile as erythromycin erythromycin estolate. Okay, and that can cause in, uh, intrahepatic cholestasis that will present as like elevations in alkaline phosphatase in a newborn. Okay, and another thing with erythromycin, right? It, it's actually associated with an increased risk of pyloric stenosis, especially if you give it within the first like eight weeks of life. Okay, I remember pyloric stenosis presents as non-bilious vomiting in a, in a kid that's less than usually less than eight to twelve weeks old on exams. Okay, uh, you classically can diagnose it with an ultrasound. You see a target sign. I talked about those high yield radiological signs in uh, I think like episode twenty six of our podcast. Now, let me just go ahead and say this. Many times on exams, especially MBMA exams, if you pay attention to age ranges, you can usually pick out the right answer or very quickly exclude wrong answers. The thing is, in general, if a kid is one year old, they cannot get pyloric stenosis on MBMA exams. Okay, Pyloric stenosis almost always shows up within the first three months of life. It's very high yield to know that. Okay, so erythromycin, uh, also being a firstborn male, right? Those all increase your risk of pyloric stenosis. Okay, now the thing with the macrolides is they also have like some mild potassium channel blocking activity. Okay, so they can actually prolong the QT interval and cause a torsa the point. Okay, uh, clarithromycin, I already talked about it in the context of triple therapy for H. pylori. Oligomycin is actually a macrolid, and I'm sure you may be like, hmm, where have I heard of oligomycin? Well, hopefully you've heard about it from reading the biochemistry chapter in first state okay oligomycin is actually a macrolide that's used for research purposes it inhibits um atp synthase complex five okay so it's just one of those bizarre factoids you do want to memorize for step one especially now what do these macrolides cover right so macrolides they cover atypical bugs right so like uh, especially the atypical causes of pneumonia like uh, mycoplasma, chlamydia, and legionella, right? And an easy way to remember that is if you spell out the word macrolid, it has an M, it has a C, and it has an L in the in the name, okay? Actually, one of the med students at my med school were the ones that have taught me this uh, nice mnemonic there. So, covers MCL, my, uh, mycoplasma, chlamydia, and legionella, okay? Uh, they also cover vaccine-preventable illnesses pretty well, right? As a general principle, like Corynebacterium diphtheriae, right? So, if you see, like, bull's neck in an immigrant or a person from, like, California, uh, like an anti-vaxxer person, uh, think about... Uh, Potentially treating that with uh, with a with a macrolid, okay? Corani bacterium diphtheriae, another high yield uh, vaccine preventable illness, uh, Bordetella pertussis, right? So like whooping cough, uh, whooping cough. Remember, it classically presents as a person that has like a nasty cough, and then they have like uh, inspiratory whoops, or 
they essentially never put that in spiratory whoops. Everyone has memorized that crap for exams, so they don't put that anymore. Uh, the thing they'll probably put is a person that has cough, and the cough is so severe that they vomit after the cough. Or they could say, oh, the person has cough, and then they have a subconjunctival hemorrhage. If you ever see that, uh, think about uh, bordetella pertussis, okay? And remember, it's a bacterial infection. And usually, if a person has a bacterial infection, you respond to that bacterial infection by... A proliferation of neutrophils, right? So your polymorphonuclear leukocytes. The thing is, Bordetella pertussis is actually typical in that respect. It's a bacterial infection that's accompanied by lymphocytosis. In fact, these people's white counts will go to like 70, 80,000. Okay, that's another unique feature of Bordetella pertussis. And Bordetella pertussis, you treat this with, uh, I mean, you should obviously get the vaccine to not have it in the first place. Uh, but, and I'll just say this right now, uh, vaccines do not cause autism. Okay. Good. So you could treat uh, whooping cough with a macrolid or you could prophylax, especially close contacts of a person that has whooping cough. You would prophylax with macrolids as well. Uh, azithromycin um, is another macrolid, right? Uh, remember, they can test this in the context of HIV AIDS because it uh, inhibits uh, sorry, it covers mycobacterium avium intracellulari, right? Remember, your magic number is a CD4 count less than 50. You want to go ahead and give azithromycin as prophylaxis against MAC. Now, I'll just go ahead and also say that the macrolids, they inhibit cytochrome P450, okay? Remember, your P450 inhibitors and inducers are high yield things you want to know for your exam. Uh, the inhibitors, right? So, there's this mnemonic you've probably read in many resources, right? The Crack Amigos mnemonic, right? So like uh, the P450 inhibitors, <coughs> right? So like uh, ciprofloxacin and your fluoroquinolones, that's the C. Ritonavir, remember that's a protease inhibitor. Talk about that in a different podcast. Uh, Amiodarone, the class 3 antiarrhythmic. Cimetidine, um, it's a H2 receptor blocker. It's used to treat uh, peptic ulcer disease. Remember, it also has androgen receptor blocking activity, so it can cause gynecomastia. Uh, the K for ketoconazole, that's an ESO, it's an antifungal medication um, acute alcohol use okay actually inhibits uh cp450 contrast that with chronic alcoholism that actually induces cytochrome p450 okay your macrolids as i already mentioned are also inhibitors that's the m of uh cp450 isoniazid that's one of your tb drugs okay um inhibits uh, cp450 grapefruit juice or meprazole, right? That's your O. And other PPIs, they also inhibit CP450. And also your sulfonamides. Remember, those are dihydrofluoric synthetase inhibitors. I'll talk about that when I talk about Bactrim, okay? Uh, your P450 inducers, right? So don't forget your, um, the mnemonic there is like Guinness, Coronas, and PBRs induce chronic alcoholism, right? So like Guinness, the G's are griseofovin, Coronas, um, carbamazepine, that's an anti-seizure med uh, medication that's also used to treat trigeminal neuralgia um, or tic de la uh, That's uh, an inducer of cytochrome P450. Uh, PBRs, right? So the P stands for phenytoin. Remember, that has zero-order metabolism. Uh, and then the B stands for the barbiturates, right? So remember, those are GABA receptor agonists. There's no rescue agent for those. The R stands for ifampin. Remember, that's an RNA polymerase inhibitor that's used to treat P uh, TB. Uh, so PBRs, the S stands for St. John's wort, okay? It's one of those uh, herbal supplements that has some mild SSRI activity. So it's used to treat depression. You can induce say P450. And classically on exams, these P450 inducers, they test them in the context of birth control. Like a lady that's taking birth control and one of these other agents, and then she becomes pregnant because she's getting reduced effectiveness of the birth control pills. Uh, so Guinness Coronas PBRs induce chronic alcoholism, right? So chronic alcoholism also induces cytochrome P450. Um, contrast that with, again with acute alcoholism that inhibits cytochrome P450. So I think this has gone on long enough. Uh, I think that's all I want to say about the, the protein synthesis inhibitors. Uh, the next time we meet in a different podcast episode, I'll go into like the TB meds, the sulfonamides, and some other like higher drugs like the fluoroquinolones and polymixins and blah, blah, blah. Okay, so have a wonderful rest of the day. Uh, I hope you're enjoying your Sunday. And this, I believe, is the first day of the uh, Eastern Conference Finals. I'm a Cleveland Cavalier supporter, so I hope they win. Uh, I wish you the best rest of the day. Have a wonderful week ahead and God bless. Thank you.